Uh, Just making sure. Uh, yeah, we can. Okay, perfect. All right. Why don't we get started? Hi, everyone. Sure. Uh, welcome to you know for joining this session. Um, we are very you know glad to have uh, you know Deepanka uh, around tonight uh, to give you a talk about Apache Iceberg. It's very exciting technology, and uh, you know you probably have heard about all the buzzword around you know lake house architecture, and that's exactly what she's uh, going to be talking about tonight. And I personally look forward to this topic as well. Uh, just to give you a quick you know introduction to Deepankar, he's currently a developer advocate at Dreamill, uh, where he's you know focusing on advocating for data engineers, data scientists, and data analysts on Dreamill's you know, open lake house uh, platform and various Apache Foundation open source projects, such as Apache Iceberg uh, and Apache Arrow as well. Um, and, uh, and he helps you know, data teams apply uh, and scale analytics. And in his past roles, he also worked at uh, the intersection of machine learning and data visualization. So he's very well uh, versatile and in many different technologies so it's definitely going to be a very exciting talk over to you Deepanka thank you so much yeah hi everyone uh, it's very good to be here and I'm pretty excited to talk about this exciting topic and you know like talk said like there's been a lot of buzzword around leak houses and you know different table formats uh, so my idea today would be like to just you know be able to like break it down like what's the table format uh, why do we you know we all throughout the year we have had a hive uh, why do we need a new one, right? Uh, and then I'll deep dive into the architecture. That would be my prime goal. And I, I will also basically like explain what happens when you do some kind of like crude operation, like you know reading or like you know inserting data. And we will end with the resulting benefits of this design approach, right? So um, I think I have had a fair good introduction. Uh, currently, I'm focusing uh, on data architectures and focusing on lake house architecture specifically, uh, but I can come from a similar like, you know, analytical background like BI and machine learning and data science. Uh, so yeah, I have, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, available in LinkedIn, Twitter, I'm, I'm a, a community guy. So I have opened up like this uh, QR code for you if you guys want to like, you know, just connect with me and we can, you know, answer any questions that you might have later as well. So um, with that, let's get started. Uh, so what is a table format? So usually with databases, we have seen the concept of tables, right? It's not a new concept at all. Like companies uh, in the past, like Oracle or Microsoft, they have been doing it with relational databases, right? So basically, uh, my understanding is that it's a way to organize a data sets file to present them as a single table, right? So users don't really need to know about the physical bytes and files, and they can just have that abstraction, you know? Uh, you can use SQL, uh, which everyone loves. Uh, you can use SQL to query the data, right? And uh, in the past, what we have seen is that database vendors like Oracle had their own storage engine. So they have used to they handle the data files on their disk, and then there is their own execution engine, which kind of like allows to interact with those data, right? Now in the big data world with Hadoop and HDFS, we ended up ultimately with Hive, the Hive table format. So more people can have access to data, right? But there was also a need to define a data set schema and how, how, to, how do we refer to the particular data set as a table, right? So engines or you know, different users can, can interact with it which basically gave rise to the Hive table format, right? Hive allowed the democratization part of the data using um, um, Hive query language, which is similar to SQL, right? So we, with Hive, we have like a table in database one, and it is composed of like one or more directories, uh, folders, right? So as you can see, it's a representation, not of course, a, like a real you know, directory, but it's a single directory with a set of files in that directory, right? So let's talk a bit about this in more detail. So in the Hive table format, tables contain, like I said, is, um, you know, is files, but in one or more directories, right? It, it's always inside directories. So here we can see one, obviously, but then at scale, this would be a lot of directories. And the tracking is done at a folder level. So whatever is there, it's in the folders, right? And this has been the de facto standard since the mass adoption of Hadoop and HDFS. So Facebook brought Hive for SQL and Hadoop, and you know uh, there was no requirement for MapReduce jobs. Basically, it allowed to democratize uh, data and let people really have that ability to like query that data, right? So it definitely being the de facto has been, you know, some of the advantages, you know, that brings it, right? And I would like to touch upon a few advantages before we really go and like, you know, say, okay, these are some of the problems. So basically it works with uh, every engine, right? So there was like no other table format that allowed that uh, up until recently that we have right now with data lake table formats. So uh, it has more efficient access patterns as well. So, you know, partitioning schemes and, mapping that to column or bucketing or, you know, so you don't have to do full table scans for every query that you write. So it is all good. 
it's also file format agnostic. So you can use any file that you want, whether it's uh, Parquet or CSV or whatever, right? And uh, you know, the most important part was that it's atomically, uh, you can atomically update a whole partition, right? So for example, you can take a whole partition, change the data, whether you want to insert some record or delete and write the data into the new partition, right? And when you're writing it, no one sees the changes, right? And that's the best part. And then you cannot atomically swap that reference in the meta store. And this is how basically the, you know, the hype meta store, you know, came into the picture and allowed us to get the atomicity and consistency and those kind of stuff. So hype meta stores became the single central answer to what's in the table, right? Every engine and every user can get the same answer irrespective of what they're using and where they're creating from. And in terms of the you know, disadvantages that we have seen, and I think I'm, I'm going to deep down more onto that, but we, we see that the smaller updates were inefficient, right? So because you can only atomically update a whole partition, if you only want to change a few records or like a few rows and a lot of times, then it's very inefficient. But then you also have the way to, you know, uh, you know, no way to change the data in multiple partitions safely. So, so basically no atomicity guarantees. If you want to insert a row in, for example, two different partitions, right? You cannot possibly do that with, you know, those kind of guarantees in high. And same with multiple jobs, like if two different engines like Flink or some other engine like Spark is, you know, trying to modify the same data set, um, those might not be safe for, you know, in, ter in terms of the guarantee and the trust of the data. So in the high table format, the files are under the folder, right? Like I said, but engine can only read files. So engine, you know, they takes a lot of time to read by going under each and every, you know, directory and, you know, finally they have to read the files. So we will deep dive more on use case, which is basically an interesting one by Netflix, uh, which basically led to the, you know, development of Apache Iceberg um, and how, how basically it took 10 minutes for Netflix to just plan a query that, you know, for a week of the data. So that would be like an interesting one. And, you know, I mean, with Hive users have to know the physical layout of the table. Uh, one of the application of this is basically like partitions, right? So if you have a table partition by day and your table has data in, for example, time step format, like year, month, date, and like, you know, hour, minute, second, it basically has to do a full table scan. So unless users explicitly mention the partition column in the query, because the engine doesn't really know, right? If there's a mapping that can translate that particular timestamp to the physical partitioning scheme, right? So you end up with very expensive scans. And at scale, I would imagine this would be like a huge problem. And most importantly, you need to educate people. The analysts are going to use that, you know, query to, you know, query the data. Also, the table statistics that were gathered were kind of stale because, like, you need to run this asynchronous periodic job, and you know, the data becomes stale. Uh, and you know, since it's an expensive job, also you have to think about how often do you run the job, right? So that that's something you know that's very you know downside of the hype. So how can we actually solve this problem, right? And these problems that I kind of discussed uh, are pretty much common, like you might have faced, you know, an organization and, you know, at scale, this is a huge problem, right? And Netflix were kind of the main one to like look at this problem. And so they went to the drawing board and they were like thinking, you know, instead of putting band-aids to each of this problem, each and every problem, why don't we take a step back and, you know, see the actual issue, what's happening, right? Because in the long term, it's going to be really difficult, you know, to you know really you know address each and every single issue like you know in one way. So they had some goals they want to achieve, and you know uh, the goals were basically like you know they needed table consistency or correctness, which everyone wants in the organization. You need to trust in the data, so that you can make this data-driven decision, right? And all the queries, if I'm you know running a query, uh, I should get the same result. Whether and then when you are running it, you should also get the same result. So that's what the expectation is, right? And we also want the faster query planning and execution. One of the queries that, you know, that I've mentioned, it took them 10 minutes to just to plan for a week of data, right? And users are not going to wait for that long as the performance is like, you know, really the key in this kind of like in analytical systems. Also, they don't want to worry about the physical layer of the data. Like, like I mentioned, for example, with partitions, you know, I have to query using a day, you know, you just should not have to worry about that, right? You know, they don't have to know the physical layout, right? So can we just have the software to take care of the data? Because users don't need to really know about that kind of information, right? Uh, and there were a lot of problems with table evolution, right? And this is something we see usually, like tables grow over time, you know, business requirements are changing. We have new requirements, see schema changes. You want to add a new column. We need to embrace that and we should be able to, you know, you know tackle that. And, you know, most importantly, to accomplish all of the steps at, at a huge scale, we can, we can take care of a small data set, but what if I had like a huge table with petabytes of data, right? And it only grows. So when looking at this, you know, problems and, you know, intermediate solution, you know, and all these cons, like, you know, they went through that they were pretty simple, you know, actually the, the whole problem was that 
I was tracking all the files at a folder level, you know, like I discussed, right? So the, the solution to that was actually very simple. You know, what you can do is you can track the file at the file level, like, you know, let's do it at the file level. That's the core, right? So you can really mitigate those cons with this small, you know, change. And that's what basically they did. And this is where Iceberg comes and into play and addresses this problem, right? So the new way of doing this would be like, you know, tracking directly the files and not the folder, right? So coming to what Iceberg is, and you know, we are going to like start with like Iceberg now. So coming to what Iceberg is and isn't, it's better to have that context because we have seen that with like Hive. Uh, Hive is quite nebulous and it can mean different things to different people. There's a Hive engine, there's a Hive table format. So I think it's important to set the motivation straight, what Iceberg is and isn't, right? So Iceberg is a table format specification. Uh, it's a table format. It's a way to you know, manage those table, you know, data that is landing in your data lake, right? It's a way to lay out the bytes in the form of the tables, that abstraction kind of. And it's a set of libraries and APIs for interaction with that specification. So any execution engine, you know, they have to basically leverage that you know, table format and you know, manage the data and process the data and do all top of you know, analytics on top of that. And it's not a storage engine or it's not an execution engine. It's not Spark, you know, it, it, it cannot do things of its own. It's just a format and specification, right? So as you can see in the image here, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is a high level, you know, you know, basically a high level overview of the, the entire iceberg architecture and the components, right? And, you know, we will go from top to bottom and try to understand like, you know, the various components of iceberg. And at the same time, we also focus on what happens when a, you know, query reads in data. So as you can see, we have, you know, the three main, like, you know, the components, like the catalog layer, which I would like to call here. And then there's the metadata layer and there is a data layer, right? So the first thing here is the iceberg catalog, right? So iceberg catalog is one of the most important thing. And if a user is trying to, or if the engine is trying to, you know, either read or write data for a table, they first need to know where to go, right? To get the data, you know, where do I find that, you know, information to go? What is the current information? So catalog is that place. It's a store that basically houses the current state of the table, right? So the concept is you can store as much data in a data lake, like an Amazon S3 or like a DLS that is scalable and cost-effective, but you need some kind of locking mechanism, right? For atomicity and strong consistency that most data lake don't provide for. And I think that's the kind of like downside we have seen with like data lake architecture, right? And now with the lake house architecture, with iceberg and like different other table formats, we are trying to solve that. So catalog basically allows you to, you know, get that atomicity guarantees and, you know, make sure that, you know, we are able to like make that, you know, make those queries and transactions in an efficient way. So the catalog can be a lot of things, you know, but there is a key requirement that it must support atomic operations, right? To update the pointer of the current metadata, right? So some of the common catalog can be, uh, you know, it can be HDFS as well, you know, on-prem Hadoop file system or most commonly ones on like Hive Metastore or like Desi, Glue, uh, you know, generate JDBC. And now we also have the new REST you know, REST API method of, you know, invoking a catalog. So in terms of what it contains, like I mentioned, it's the, basically the mapping of the name to the location of the current metadata file. So this is where is the current metadata file and you need to know to, you know, historically like be able to like open that file and like do the operation. So what, for what happens is, for example, if you need to do like a, let's say select star from, you know, the database table with some kind of limit. So what you do is you go to the catalog and basically ask for that location. Hey, you know, where is my current manager file? Can you give me that location, right? And once we get that location, you know, we, we go on and, you know, move to the next part, which is like the manager file. So now I know that, okay, this is my current manager file. So now I have that information and I can see that, okay, this is my current manager file and this is where all my information is, right? So metadata file, as the name suggests, it basically stores metadata about, uh, you know, a table at a certain point of time. And you can, you know, basically see from the, you know, the screenshot here that, you know, it contains the current snapshot ID and, you know, um, you know, that's something a very important to iceberg as well. And, you know, snapshot basically is a state of a table, table at a given point of time. So basically whatever operations you do, like creating a table, whether it's adding a record or deleting something, everything is captured as a snapshot in iceberg. And that allows you to do all those kind of operations that we are going to look into later, like time travel, right? And that's really important, like, you know, for organization. So, so for our select query, you know, we got the current metadata file and, you know, here we get the current snapshot ID. So we know that this is our current snapshot that's getting, you know, that's the recent one. And using that, we can get the manifest list, right? And the manifest list is just over here in the metadata and you can use it to get the manifest list. And from the manifest list, you can open the manifest file and manifest list basically, you know, is a, is a list of all the manifest files basically. So 
a manifest layer is kind of like a list which has all the information about different manifests. In the production environment, you will probably have a lot of manifest files, right? And you, Iceberg, you know, needs to keep a track of those files. And this is how Iceberg does it using a manifest list. So we have the information here, like the manifest file path, uh, when it was added, partition specs, and those kind of information. So, so for example, uh, you know, it can help in something like partition pruning, right? So you don't really need to go to the actual data file. So now, you know, we have the manifest list and the manifest file, and you know, we will read one of the manifest file, and we don't need to read all of them, right? So the manifest file gives us the actual list of the data file, you know, uh, and those data files can be obviously, you know, parquet or like, you know, anything else. So along with a lot of details, you know, and, and that's something that's really important, specifically in cases like, you know, query optimization and this kind of stuff, right? So we see details such as the file format, which is per here in the screenshot. And, you know, we see a couple of important statistics like the lower bound and the column level metrics, the upper bound of the column, right? And what is the number of, you know, NAND value counts, right? you know? This is super helpful, like in terms of pruning the files and avoiding scan of all the files, you know, thus making sure that our queries remain faster, you know, so whatever engine you use. So this is really crucial information. So at a leaf level, if I have to say, a manifest file basically keeps a track of all the data files. And now for our query, which is like a select one, we will basically grab a data file and return it back to the engine, right? And this may seem like a lot, but this is way, way faster at runtime. So that's basically like a, a high level idea. Uh, now we'll go through like a, a deep dive of what happens under the cover, like, you know, when you do some kind of operation, right? Create and insert and this kind of stuff, right? So let's say we start with like creating a table, like an iceberg table, right? So let's say it's a create table statement. We have a couple of fields and, you know, we will see, basically we'll try to diagrammatically see what happens in each of the component in iceberg, right? So on the left, you can see there is this catalog and there is also the actual file, like the storage that you can see in your data lake, whether it's on-prem like S3 or Hadoop file system or whatever it is, right? And then, you know, um, in the right, we have basically the, the different components, uh, the different layers of iceberg. So we have we created a table with four columns here, and we have the order timestamp column, which basically we have partitioned by that particular column, right? And you can see I have used like uh, you know the, to partition it, we've used a, a transformation function here, which is like the R, and we will look more onto it. But you can see that it's partitioned by a reference or a transformation of an existing column. So unlike Hive, where you would need to create a new column, you don't need to do it here. You can just apply transformation, and I work you know keeps a track of those transformation, right? So User, so we created a table and it adds, uh, like, as you can see, you know, it adds a metadata file, right, you know, and it is the metadata file will consist of all the schema details and all the information of the column and all those stuff. So we, the reason we don't see anything else here or not a data file is that we really haven't inserted anything or, you know, uh, injected any data here, right? So that's why we only see the metadata file, which is a specification, since it's only a create statement. Next. So once we are done with the creating the table, we let's see what happens when we do the insert, right? And we want to insert some data. And you know, when we go and execute that statement, we want to see what happens underneath. So let's say we want to like you know run this particular query, right? So what happened is whatever engine you use this for like this particular insert query from whatever engine you were running in, it first went and wrote the data file in the parquet format, right? And that's the first thing it does. And when the engine is writing that the data file, which is the parquet file. It also knows the info, like the statistics that I was talking about, the upper bounds and the lower bounds, the null value counts, et cetera, right? So the engine creates a manifest file with those details, right? And that's how the manifest file is here, right? So as you can see, um, you know, those information that we have in, in, the in, the, in the file form, in the table, in the actual file storage as well, like that's the manifest file, right? And then finally, the manifest file is linked to the manifest list, which is basically tracking all the manifest file, right? And finally, we have the metadata file, right? And that's the, the that's the main information for us, you know, because like we will have an engine come to the catalog and ask for the metadata file, right? That's what we went through. So rem remember from the first like the create statement, we created the we had a you know a different metadata file and, and we had this first snapshot as you. Now when we did the second the second statement, which is the insert statement, it basically what it did is it took that previous snapshot, right? And you know, it basically took that snapshot and replaced the current one, you know, because that's the new operation that we made. And it replaced that, you know, the current metadata file from the catalog to the V2 version two. So as you can see in the catalog, now the version one metadata file is not referenced, whereas it's just version two, which is our recent metadata file. 
So this is what basically happens, you know, uh, to, to just sum it up, basically the engine writes the data file, the data file has all the statistics and all the information, and then the manifest file is created, and then the manifest list tracks all this information, finally updating it to the metadata label and the catalog. One last operation which I want to like talk about is the absurd statement. And, uh, you know, and this is how like, you know, there, you might run into a lot of scenarios where you see this absurd statement coming in, right? Now, so let's say we ingested some data, you know, hypothetically, let's say we ingested some data into the staging table and we want to do an absurd, right? That is, we want to do a merge into, right? So we look into the order ID and if there is a match, what we do is we update that order amount in the table. And if there is no match, then we're just going to say, just do an insert, right? So what we'll do is we'll go and run ahead and you know run this statement. And let's say for our you know explanation and demo purpose, there is just one row in the original table that we're going to update, and there is another that doesn't exist in the original table. So it's just going to be a normal insert. So after running this particular statement, we can see the same kind of flow again, right? You know, we, we have the same kind of flow now, the same kind of hierarchical iceberg tree, you know, from data files back to the metadata file and the catalog, right? But interesting thing to note here is that we have two different partitions here. Like you can see, you know, you know, two different partitions here. And we still see the original data file that we created, like which are kind of like grayed out. But now we have actually written a new version of it, right? So we read the original data file and we updated the order amount, right? When I was talking about we we're going to update the table with the you know updated order amount. So we updated the order amount of file and, and it was into the same order ID, and we had a new order as well. So which is in a different partition. So let's say hypothetically it's two hours later. So that's why we have the, the inserted record in a different partition and the updated record in the previous partition, right? And finally, the catalog is now updated to reflect the new version, which is the version three, right? Now we have the third operation, which is like the third. So just to recap, every operation that we're doing is getting you know, you know, recorded as a snapshot. And we, as a writer, it has to be ensured that you know, the version is referenced to the latest one so that any new you know, operations or any new queries that comes in, we can look into the current one and you know, you know, take it from there. So that's basically like at a high level what the you know, different crude operation works. But you know, one last thing that would be like to understand, okay, now I, I have all this data, right? And I want to do like understand how a select query works under the hood, right? So for example, the user give me the query, right? The orders, you know, select start from table when the order date is January 26, 2021, right? So going back to the high world, if we had such a statement, I would say, well, well I'm not partitioned by date, you know, I'm partitioned by hour. And the partition would probably be something like 2021 slash 01 slash 26 and the hour of time, whatever it is. And you would end up reading the entire table unless you specify that in the statement, you know, as a user, as analyst, you want to like make sure that's in the statement, which we've discussed is a huge problem at scale, right? So great. Now what happens with the iceberg, right? So we will basically go through the same flow again, you know, how we'll start here, you know, we go to the catalog and we go and ask the catalog, hey, give me the latest, you know, current snapshot version, give me the latest metadata file. So based on a metadata file, it retrieves them, you know, metadata manifest list. And since the manifest list we are reading here is this one, you know, it goes and goes, goes to the manifest file that's being controlled by the manifest list, right? So it understands that this particular field, for example, if we talk about this particular query, it knows that, you know, iceberg knows that this partition by field order timestamp, but the field is an hour transform of the order timestamp, right? So then now the engine can use that information and know that if they're asking for date this, it can effectively look for only partition where date is equal to 26 and, you know, from, the from time like hours from zero to 23 hours. And this way it only has to scan one partition and not the other one. So this is like a very good way to like, you know, prune files and be, you know, able to like, return those results in a more effective way and in a faster way. So the key is really is storing that reference on the transform in Iceberg and Iceberg does that pretty well. So let's look at another use case, which is very common in the data warehousing world and how it's also really important in the data lakehouse platforms and little lakehouse architecture, which is time travel, right? So time travel basically means you wanna like, you know, retrieve the data, you know, from a historical, you know, snapshot, right? You know, you wanna go back and say, Hey, I want to like, I'm doing some financial reporting and I want to get like end of the week or end of the quarter data, right? How do I get that? So does Iceberg allow that? Yes, for sure. Like Iceberg, you know, does time travel pretty well. So let's say if we do like a statement like this, like a select star from this particular table and as of that particular, you know, timestamp, right? So after hypothetically for this demonstration, let's say this is basically when we did that insert, but before that merge into, right? Before that absurd. Right, so Iceberg is going to go follow the same path again, right? You know, it's going to the catalog for the current metadata pointer, 
And you know, from the metadata pointer, it opens the metadata file. And now in the metadata file, the iBook keeps the list of all the snapshots. It basically is an array of all the snapshots, right? So if you look at it program programmatically, or if I had to like, you know, you know, explain it programmatically, it's, it's basically uh, an array of all the snapshots. So it consists all of them. So if you look for the current snapshot ID, there is a field called current snapshot ID. And based on the user's request, for example, in this case, it's 26 May 2021, 9.30. And in this way, it will know that the current snapshot is, let's say, you know, S1 for this purpose. So now it will read the manifest list, right? That corresponds to the particular snapshot, right? And finally, follow the same path. You know, it goes to the same path of going from the manifest list, to the manifest file, and finally be able to get that data file. And this flow is quite similar to the, you know, the select star with the select the read query that we saw, like, but this time the user has a slightly different request, which is what basically the time table purpose was, right? So in the data lake, we will access this grade file, right? This is the grade file that was there, right? You know, that, that was from a previous like operation and we want to get that particular file data, right? So this file is not active, which is why it's grayed out here, uh, but it's still there, right? And, you know, snapshot, obviously like, you know, over a period of time, uh, you know, you can end up with a lot of snapshot. So you don't want to like, you know, you want to have an effective snapshot, you know, maintenance policy in your organization so that they can be expired. And Iceberg provides APIs to expire the snapshot and maintain it in a timely way, right? So based on your requirement, you can keep decide on which to keep and which not to keep. So we went through the different crude operations and the path Iceberg follows to, let's say, you know, read a file or insert and those kind of operation. Now let's see how things look at scale and in kind of like production environment, like some, some real use case that I was talking about. So this study is straight from Ryan Blue, who basically co-created like co Iceberg, Apache Iceberg during his time at Netflix. Uh, it's just a presentation from him. And, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting case study. Like, you know, the time series metric system, which is called Atlas. It basically, you know, uh, in a month, of, they had like 3 million files in like close to 3,000 partition, right? And their problem, their problem was that they cannot process more than a few days of data, right? If you look at the, you know, the query that I have, you know, up for you, uh, it's a pretty basic query, right? You know, like, you know, you, it's, 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 it's like you are trying to like get like the distinct tag uh, based on the type from their data, you know, from their data lake. And, you know, what you're trying to do is you are trying to have a filter based on a date field, which is like just a week's of data, like 22nd August to 28th of August, right? Now, we, like with the high table format where, you know, where now Ryan and team is were using it at Netflix, this particular query, it took just 10 minutes to explain the query and not even execute it, right? So just getting the files and you know, planning, you know, for an optimizer to like take the query, it took the majority amount of time, right? Now with the iceberg, you know, this particular operation, this particular query, you know, it just with basic partition data filtering, it the execution time was just 13 minutes, right? But the planning time was just 10 seconds, you know? So really from like 10 minutes of planning time, to just 10 seconds of planning time. And that's some dramatic improvement, I would say, like in terms of like the planning, right? But if you do like a mean max filtering along with the partition filtering, which is what we saw in like the presentation with all the you know, column level metrics in the manifest uh, file, right? The execution just took 42 seconds from like 13 minutes. So this time the execution in total, not even the planning, it took just 42 seconds from 13 minutes. And as compared to the high table format, where only like, you know, it took 10 minutes to just plan, right? And this is, I think, a pretty impressive, like, you know, use case. I like to take it forward. So another key kind of capability that Iceberg provides is like the ability to do like compaction, right? Compaction is a known problem, right? We have seen in the big data world and, you know, problem with small files, you know, we gather like, for example, when you're doing a lot of streaming, like it might lead to a lot of like, you know, small files. And then there is this overhead on the part of the query engine study to every time open and read this small file, you know, which is pretty cost in the intensive, like at scale specifically, right? When you're dealing with large scale analytics. So how does Iceberg deal with that, right? So the concern here is your writers and even the readers, right? They need the fresh data, right? That's, that's what we have established, right? So get a row, write a row, you know, but the problem is the fixed overhead on both read and side, write side is super high, right? So when working with data, there's always this read side versus the right side trade off, like, you know, you want low latency in right side, uh, so you get a record and you want to write it, right, as soon as you get it. But if you do this for every single record, you'll end up with one record per file. And that's basically the extreme of the small file problem, right? But on the read side, you want high throughput, right? You know, you doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you have too many records in one single file. You don't, you don't have to pay the side cost. So it's, it's fine, like, you know. 
So what compaction in Iceberg allows you to do is basically balance the read and the write side data, right? So Iceberg says there is no problem with writing more data and creating small files, right? But what Iceberg APIs will enable is to compact those small files in one large file. So in the write read side, there is high throughput, right? And it's fast. And, and this is all asynchronous in the background. You know, the users are not impacted about it. Like the users don't even have to know about it. Versus like in Hive, where like, you know, compaction or like update at one time or update to one single partition and only by one particular job can be done at one single time, right? Which is, which is like a real bummer. Right? So with Iceberg, you don't have to worry about any of that, right? All these are asynchronous operations. So users always see the fresh data, right? Users always see the fresh data no matter what. And the read throughput is really high. So the performance, on the read side is also really high. And a key thing to note here is that Iceberg, like I said, is not an engine or like a storage or execution engine, but it's a set of APIs, right? So scheduling and triggering and compaction work is done by like external tools, right? For example, you can use like processing engine like Spark or Dremio to like, you know, process the data. And you can use like, you know, schedulers, to like, you know, different kind of schedulers to like, you know, trigger or schedule this job, right? So this is what basically like Iceberg you know, facilitates in a much better way or in a much efficient way as compared to like the previous you know, table formats. So now let's talk about a couple of the, you know, we have gone to basically at a high level how we understood the architecture of Iceberg and the different components and how we can like, you know, how, you know, different query engines can take advantage of Iceberg as a table format and use it for like effective reading of files and writing of files, right, uh, in a Lakehouse architecture. So now let's talk about the benefits uh, in terms of the design benefits, like how what Iceberg brings to the table, right? So first, you can efficiently make smaller updates. So since now everything is at the file level and you know, um, and not a folder level, and files can only get so big, right? One twenty eight MB or like two fifty six megs. So you can make a lot of changes effectively, right? So that's really you know I think one of the best advantage, and you know Iceberg provides that for the isolation. So the reads, basically the reads that you're trying to do, do not interfere with the writes, right? So, and, the, and vice versa, right? And the writes are kind of atomic, right? You know, uh, here you don't see things like partial writes, right? It's an atomic operation. It also gives you the concurrent write option, like where multiple people, multiple engines can write at the same table at, you know, at the same time. And that's one of the like, you know, biggest advantage of Iceberg that we have seen that, you know, it allows you to concurrently write data, you know, use models like optimistic concurrency control uh, you know, and, you know, for example, like, you know, you need to obviously have some checks in place, like, you know, you will modify the files, but the file needs to be at least present, right? So using techniques like optimistic concurrency control, uh, you can like have multiple engines write at the same time, right, on the same data. Um, this also allows uh, faster planning and execution. And the key here is that the list of files is defined on the right side, right? OLAP analytics in general is like write once and read a number of times. So Iceberg questions about that cost, right? Like, why do we have to collect all the statistics, uh, et cetera, when reading, right? And specifically when we know we are gonna read like a thousand times more than write, right? So it gives that read side benefit uh, and advantage. Uh, same thing for kind of like the statistics, right? Uh, all the statistics, you know, that are stored in the manifest file, they can be used to eliminate the file for, you know, file pruning, file skipping, right? And the engine basically, is the one that writes to statistics in the manifest file, right? So if engine is already know, if engine already knows about the statistics, why not let the engine do that part, right? And because of that, we also get like the reliable metrics, right? Instead of expensive read, we do it on write, and this is a huge benefit for any you know, any cost based optimizer, right? Uh, any query that you issue at scale now has the right join order and those kind of stuff. And another part that we kind of love with Iceberg is that uh, it abstract the physical view and exposes a logical view. For example, things that I talked about, like the hidden partitioning, right? It's one of the key features of Iceberg. So Iceberg do, do not need to know about the physical, you know, the column. It doesn't need to create any column, nor as a user, you need to be able to know that particular location and, you know, the physical layer of the table, right? It kind of gets that abstraction done, right? And the, trans the relation between the partition column and the transformation column is maintained like in Iceberg, right? So that kind of gives us the advantage, right? We don't have to know about like it and, you know, users always see the fresh data, right? Similar thing with compaction, right? You know, we talk about compaction a bit, like, you know, how we can have a lot of small files and users don't even know, need to know that you're running a compaction job to create those files. So this also means the table can, you know, evolve over time, right? We didn't touch upon much in this particular presentation, but Iceberg supports full schema evolution, full partition evolution, right? 
And uh, with Hive, you know, as far as my experience goes, it has been like file dependent. Like for example, you know, if you make changes to a table with like CSV versus Parquet, it's all going to be handled slightly differently. So it allows, you know, Icebook allows for schema evolution, partition evolution, and even coexistence of two different partitioning schemes, right? So the total flexibility, which also means data engineers can now transparently experiment with the table layout, right? You know, they have more time to do for focused, you know, infrastructure stuff or, you know, transformation stuff, right? So definitely rich schema evolution support is one of the big aspect of it. Like, you know, how we can evolve the schema without like really rewriting the entire table in Iceberg. Like, you know, that's really important. And also all the engines, they see those changes immediately, right? Any kind of change that goes into the Iceberg table, you know, it's, it's a very, it's an immediate change, right? You know, uh, what basically happens is that everything is well maintained in the catalog. So that's where the current pointer is, like the current metadata references, right? So every engine, no matter what changes it is, it will go to the catalog and ask for it, like, hey, give me the, you know, the current metadata file. And so no matter of like whatever engine you're using, it's, it's gonna be the same, right? That, that's a, ultimately like gives us a lot of benefit in terms of like how we, you know, deal with, because like with modern Lakehouse architecture, there might be different variety of tools that you're gonna use. Like, you know, you can use Spark for processing or Dremio for processing. You can use Flink for streaming or like you know, some other tool for machine learning, right? So you need to be able to like, you know, make sure like, you know, any kind of new like, tool that you bring in, they see the same data and you are able to you know, make it future, future proof, right? So that's like the overall, the idea that I had like in general, what Iceberg you know, does in terms of the architecture. Uh, you know, I, I, I basically, I think one of the main important part to like, you know, go back here is that Iceberg gives us that facility now that we kind of like are moving towards the lake house architecture and you know, instead of running those costly warehouse level operations, now we can do it like in you know, an open table format like Iceberg and put it on top of a data lake and have the flexibility, reduce cost. And also like, you know, it, it kind of like gives us that ability to like have that open data architecture, which I think is super important. Given, like I said, like, you know, it makes your architecture future proof. You bring in any new tool, it doesn't matter. You know, you're not locked into a particular vendor, right? You know, you're not loading it to a particular vendor's warehouse or like, you know, you're not, you know, using their own storage or execution engine to process the data. Now that the data is, all that in open format, and you can use any kind of engine to access the data. So, in terms of how you get started with Iceberg, I think you know um, the Iceberg. You know, I'm pretty much involved with the Iceberg community, and you know the Iceberg got a patch or org is the official page where you can see you know all the latest stuff that is happening with Iceberg. And you know, Iceberg also has a curated list of blogs, which a lot of companies like you know the adoption has been huge. Like from Dremio, we contribute a lot. Uh, so like, you know, Tableau does a lot as well. And we see companies like Cloudera and now Snowflake, you know, migrating towards that and, you know, kind of embracing Iceberg. And so then a lot of community stuff is happening. Uh, we want to ensure we have like a diverse community representation in Iceberg. So we can, you know, take this motivation and take those, you know, implementation ahead based on the entire community, right? So we also have like, you know, uh, the Dremio subsurface side, which is totally dedicated to all things open source and, you know, Arrow and Iceberg. So I personally like write a lot in terms of like, you know, how the different features in Iceberg are, like how you can like, you know, improve the performance with, you know, different kind of like layouts and those kind of stuff, right? So that's that's a really good place as well. And, you know, getting started is, is also like a good way, good way to get started. Like there are like, we have pre built Docker files, which allows you to like get started and experiment with it at a ground level without, you know, really invoking a lot of third party tools. So that is pretty much it. Um, we, I think I can take any you know, question that you might have as of now. Let me quickly go to the chat. Anchor. Hey guys, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, there was a question earlier uh, from Brian. Uh, yeah. If you update one, is it the whole table rec replicated with a new snapshot ID? Yes, so every operation, like I said, every operation that you make in Iceberg is, is going to be tracked as a snapshot. So if you update one particular record, you know, the entire, like the, 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 snap, the entire tree that I kind of basically illustrated is going to be updated with the new snapshot. So that snapshot is going to be there and it's going to be really helpful for those kind of like time travel operations and, you know, going back and looking historically at the data. Uh, I, I got a question here that says being open source, any cybersecurity concern? Um, not really, because we, you know, obviously in general with any open source, you know, there, there are concerns in terms of organizational approach and how we kind of deal with that. 
but you know obviously like the whole idea with the open data lake architecture is that lake architecture is that you know the data lies in open table format right and that's the whole idea so i think it kind of gives that advantage to it right so that's something that's important uh i got one from sorrow that says if possible can you talk about the pros and cons of iceberg against delta yeah, so um, I, I can touch on a few, like, uh, you know, Delta Lake is another table format, which basically um, Delta Lake has two versions. One is like data, data breaks, the proprietary one, and one is the open source one. And uh, also there is another format, like you, I, I'd like to mention at the same time, Apache Hoodie as well, right? So these three table formats have been, you know, there. And I have personally, I haven't personally, like, worked in Delta space as well. But in terms of the features, you know, I think, like, right now we are at, like, Feature wise, we are not going to have that much, this, you know, distinction because we are still going to like, you know, ensure new features come in and, you know, it's pretty much is going to be same in every kind of table format, but in general, like, you know, like things like, you know, hidden partitioning, you know, those kind of things are really important and stands out in iceberg. Right. Um, so that's something important. And I think the implementation details also varies a lot, you know, in terms of how you like, you know, deploy it and whether it's, uh, you know, different platforms and how you deal with that, you know, uh, also the, the way of managing things can be a bit different. For example, like, you know, recently in Iceberg, we introduced like Z order partitioning, like Z order clustering, which is basically an optimization algorithm to like, you know, optimize your data fields more effectively. Uh, Delta also does that, but in a, probably the implementation is similar, but in a, you know, different perspectives and different ways. So overall, you know, the future level, the things are going to be same, but the implementation details and, uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of benchmarking happening. So, you know, I would like, I can also share a couple of, you know, information in terms of how the benchmarkings are and in terms of how the feature level comparisons are. Uh, we also have a really good comparison article between the different table formats. I see this question from like uh, the academy and talk about hoodie. So yeah, we have a really good article that kind of touches upon iceberg and Delta Lake and hoodie and compares them in, in different, different perspectives, like open source contributions, like features and those kind of stuff. So I, I'm pretty sure I'm, I, I can share those information as well. Uh... I like hundreds. Of, yeah, I, I got a follow up from Ramesh. It says follow to Brian question how updates are scalable, like 100 updates per hour versus 1,000 updates per hour. Yeah, I think scalability is a huge aspect. I think that the whole concept of having Iceberg in the face, first place in Netflix was that they want to deal with those kind of, you know, uh, you know, updates and those kind of like, you know, uh, leverages with terms of like how you scale it. So definitely, like, you know, uh, definitely they are very scalable. And, you know, Iceberg is designed from ground up. For that purpose, so it serves that you know uses pretty well. I have a question from Lisa. Uh, at what stage of a company in their data cycle would you suggest migrating from Hive to Iceberg? Would you recommend this over a NoSQL database for streaming data? Yeah, good question. So yeah, I, I think this all this would all totally depend, obviously, on the use cases and applications that you want to you know run on top of it, and you know depending on your architecture. But definitely, we have seen a lot of like you know. Um, mid-sized companies, you know, who are targeting and who are, you know, focusing on a lake house kind of architecture where they get the benefits of a warehouse directly on a data lake and at a cheaper cost, right? I think that's also a very important thing to remember, right? We have the scalability and, uh, you know, agility of a data lake, right? Which is, which is great. Like, we don't have to worry about, like, uh, you know, the cost that we put into, like, storing data in a warehouse, right? Now it's, it's all open and, you know, S3 or ADLS, it's really cheap right now, right? So... I think it will totally depend on like your use cases and applications and, you know, um, what you want to do and achieve on top of your, like, you know, the table format, which is like basically a robust architecture. So in terms of like my recommendation, whether I would recommend this over a NoSQL database for streaming data, I think this is a good, you know, opportunity, like, you know, in, in terms of streaming data, we have seen a lot of, you know, streaming happening from playing to iceberg tables and running again, like, you know, analytics like BI and ML on top of that. So definitely, you know, uh, it's a good use case, yeah, definitely. Um, I see another one from Brian. It says, can you do a cache query? Uh, Iceberg has some caching option for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I can share some resources in that. I haven't really worked on that particular space um, pretty much more like in detail, but I can share some uh, you know, info around that. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, definitely we can do cache query, yeah. So I think that is all I have until now. Uh, Shao, if you want to like, like take anything else or, you know, I, I, I can share the presentation as well. And I, like I said, you know, like the questions, some of the question, I think it would make sense to share some of the links as well. 
uh, I think they kind of give a good idea in terms of the benchmarking and when people are looking at different different table formats. So, okay, I got another one with uh, from Ramesh. Iceberg with high catalog, how well it works. Oh yeah, that's a pretty pretty common thing. Like, you know, high meta store or high catalog. It's, it's one of the most common things that I have seen. Uh, the only thing that we don't recommend is not to use HDFS in production as a catalog, because again, with the atomicity guarantees and those kind of issues, it might be a problem. So that's the only thing, but with high catalog, it's pretty well, it's like the most standard way, right? Yeah. Any recommendations for connecting to Tableau? Yes. Yeah, so um, obviously, you can, you know, in, in a lake architecture, you have like, you know, the data that is in your data lake, and then you have the, the different raw files like Parquet or ORT or like, you know, Avril. And the table formats come on top of that, right? The iceberg, you know, helps to manage those files. So obviously, you know, you can connect from like, you know, there is no direct way to connect from Tableau as of now with Iceberg, but obviously, you know, there are like, for example, Dremio, like, you know, the company that I work for, you know, Dremio's lead health platform, it directly allows you to like, you know, connect that, you know, Tableau to the Iceberg data, right? You know, you don't have to separately like deal with like, you know, extracting the data from a data lake to a warehouse and then be able to run like Tableau or Power BI or any kind of like BI or ML tool. So now you have the ability like with tools like Vimeo, like to directly uh, run or like build dashboards around that, you know, using the iceberg data. Um, I have another from Saurav. What is the adoption rate of iceberg by various cloud provider and BI tool? So the adoption rate in terms of the industry, how we are like, you know, evolving is that we now see like a huge, you know, adoption rate in terms of the table format in general. Like, you know, we Dremio have been like, you know, we, we dedicatedly focus and contribute towards a lot to Iceberg. Tableau is doing that. And your different vendors like now with like, you know, you're like, you know, Google BigQuery now supports Iceberg. Uh, you know, different Amazon Athena, like you know, this Athena supports Iceberg. And, you know, different tools are coming with Cloudera, Snowflake now with external tables. So different, different vendors are coming with different, different, you know, uh, support now plan. And in terms of the various cloud services and data lakes, S3, ADLS, GCS, whatever it is, you can use it. BI tools, that's something that you have to like rely on, for example, a leakhouse platform that will allow you to connect to those particular data, you know, table format. Um, Iceberg S3 Hadoop connector versus native S3 file connector. Anything you can consider while I'm not sure I mean, uh, exactly what that means, but if you want to reach out to me you know, later, that's uh, something I can answer that as well. I can take a note of it. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, um, reach out and like, you know, if you have like any, uh, like, like I said, I'm pretty much, you know, active in the community as well in terms of Apache Iceberg, like, you know, uh, there is a Slack group as well of Apache Iceberg, which uh, I would highly suggest like to join in terms of happening, like getting updates of, in terms of what's happening. We have plans of a uh, new version coming in, like which is going to be more production ready. And like people, you know, organizations have been really using it in production. Like Apple is using it a lot in production in their environments. Uh, so we see, you know, those kind of adoption as well. So definitely, uh, you know, reach out and uh, I'll be happy to answer any other quick queries and LinkedIn or Twitter. Yeah, um, I can write my LinkedIn, you know, I can share my LinkedIn account as well once again. I have to go back to the slide. Let me quickly. There is there is my scan code, but I can also paste my URL in the chat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepanka. This is a great talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad to be able to talk about it as well. Yeah, you know, it's really exciting that people are motivated and like want to know more about it. So yeah, thanks for the opportunity. That's awesome. All right, thanks everyone uh, for your participation in this uh, in this workshop, and uh, we will be sharing the the recording link with you, uh, you know, through email follow up. Uh, but once again, uh, thank you so much, Deepanka. We would love to have you back in the future to give sure. another talk. Um, in All right, yeah, I look forward to that. Yeah, have a good thanks. one, everyone. Have a good one. Bye, Bye everyone.